Post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD, is a common condition that affects around 3% of people at any given time. At its core, PTSD is defined by a specific set of signs, symptoms, and behaviors that arises following exposure to a life-threatening event. These include re-experiencing the trauma frequently through flashbacks and nightmares, constantly scanning the environment for threats even when in safe situations, attempting to avoid people, places, or things that are reminiscent of the trauma, and cutting oneself off from their own emotions. Together, these symptoms and behaviors have the potential to turn a single traumatic event into years or even decades of fear and suffering. Other factors can also predict an increased risk of developing PTSD. In particular, people who are younger at the time of trauma, who went through their trauma alone, who had little or no time to process the experience, and who had low social support after the trauma, tended to be at the highest risk. The combined effect of these factors was vividly illustrated in veterans returning from the Vietnam War. Compared to those who served in World War II, Vietnam War soldiers were younger, 19 years on average compared to 26, and were often assigned a tour of duty in predetermined time frames which broke up social cohesion, as opposed to soldiers in World War II who trained, fought, and returned home largely with the same group of peers. After the war, Vietnam War veterans had little time to process, as getting home by plane took less than a day, compared to the 30-day journey by ship that World War II vets experienced. Finally, upon returning home, Vietnam veterans received little social support, and many were greeted with protesters rather than parades. All of these factors together account for the fact that soldiers who fought in the Vietnam War developed PTSD at significantly higher rates than those returning from World War II, even though the nature of the trauma itself, military combat, was largely the same. However, these factors still don't tell the whole story. Otherwise, everyone who experienced the same trauma under the same circumstances would develop PTSD at roughly the same rate. In reality, studies on groups of veterans who fought together through the same traumatic events have shown that only about 20% develop PTSD, while the other 80% do not. To account for this, we need to look at factors specific to the person experiencing the trauma, and in particular, differences in how each person's brain processes traumatic events. Three regions of the brain in particular are involved here, the amygdala, the hippocampus, and the medial prefrontal cortex. These regions are all involved in regulating someone's fear response. When experiencing a life-threatening situation, the amygdala generates the initial surge of fear. The medial prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus then act to fine-tune the amygdala's response by integrating information about the environment as well as one's past experiences. Let's use an example to better understand how these three brain regions work together. Let's say that we suddenly hear the sound of a loud explosion. The amygdala immediately kicks in and interprets the explosion as a dangerous thing, like a bomb. The amygdala then activates the sympathetic nervous system and its fight or flight response, inducing a state of fear. However, we then realize that the sound of the explosion is happening during a fireworks show on the 4th of July, and our fear response goes away. This is the role that the medial prefrontal cortex plays. It is able to take other sensory information, such as visuals of American flags and the emotional context of smiling faces around us, and integrate them into an unconscious thought that maybe the explosion is nothing to be worried about after all. The medial prefrontal cortex then steps in to tell the amygdala to back off and allow us to enjoy the fireworks without being in an uncomfortable state of fear. The second brain region that acts as a break in the amygdala, the hippocampus, also helps to regulate the fear response, but this time by using memories of the past. Someone who sees another person in a scary mask may initially feel a sense of fear. However, they also know based on their experiences of holidays over their lifetime that unsettling masks are nothing to be afraid of on Halloween, and this information is accessed via the hippocampus. So when this person goes out trick-or-treating, their hippocampus kicks into gear and suggests to the amygdala that things aren't as frightening as they seem. In contrast, for someone at high risk of developing PTSD, the amygdala is not only overactive, generating stronger than average fear responses, but the medial prefrontal cortex and hippocampus are both underactive, handicapping their ability to attenuate the fear response by using environmental cues and past memories. 
It is this combination of an overactive amygdala, an underactive medial prefrontal cortex, and an underdeveloped hippocampus that is most characteristic of PTSD. As someone with these traits is more likely to react to trauma with strong negative emotions and less able to integrate sensory information from the environment and memories of happier times in their lives to lessen the sting of a traumatic event. Understanding the contributions of both the trauma itself as well as the neurobiological traits of the person experiencing it allows us to unravel the enigma of trauma and work to ensure that the suffering caused by a traumatic event is kept to a minimum. It also helps to remove the stigma of PTSD by allowing people to recognize that in many cases the effects of trauma are largely out of our control. After all, the only thing worse than experiencing PTSD is to also believe that you are somehow weaker, sicker, or not trying as hard as the people around you. Trauma doesn't have to be the terrible gift that keeps on giving. By learning more about the nature of PTSD, we can get better at recognizing it in ourselves and others, and find faster ways of getting help. Hi everyone, thanks for watching this latest video. If you're interested in this topic or in learning about mental health in general, consider checking out my new book, Memorable Psychiatry, which was just released a few months ago. If you're wanting to learn more about psychiatric medications, look at some of the other videos on my channel or my book, Memorable Psychopharmacology. Both books are available on Amazon. I'll put the link in the description below. In the meantime, if anyone has any questions or ideas for future videos, let me know in the comments. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. A person needs to experience symptoms in four separate categories beyond just exposure to a traumatic event. One of these is the experience of intrusion symptoms, which look like the recurrent, intrusive, and distressing memories of the event. An intrusive thought or memory means we aren't recalling it on purpose. It is not voluntary, but rather appears when we aren't expecting it and we don't want to think about it. Intrusive thoughts can make a person feel as if they don't have control over their thinking, which is distressing in and of itself, let alone that the traumatic memory is also painful. Other intrusive symptoms include recurrent distressing dreams or nightmares and flashbacks. Flashbacks are wakeful moments in which the person feels as if they are reliving or acting out the traumatic event all over again. The last set of intrusion symptoms are experiencing extended and intense emotional and physical distress when exposed to internal or external circumstances that remind us of the traumatic event, such as certain sights, sounds, or smells. A person needs to experience symptoms in four separate categories beyond just exposure to the traumatic event. One of these categories is avoidance symptoms, which is where an individual begins to avoid circumstances directly tied to the traumatic event. It is important that the avoidance began after the traumatic event occurred and not prior. The first set of symptoms is the avoidance of distressing memories, thoughts, or feelings associated with the traumatic event. The next set of symptoms takes that a bit further into that a person also avoids people, places, conversations, activities, objects, etc. that may then cause them to have those distressing memories, thoughts, or feelings. This may seem like a common sense response to a terribly painful experience, but avoidance symptoms can drive a person into unhealthy isolation and disconnection with a supportive and healing environment. Extensive research supports that avoidance does not allow for a person to heal from their traumatic wound. It may feel good in the moment, but it is ultimately making the situation worse. One of these is the experience of cognitive symptoms, which are marked change in a person's mood or thinking that began or worsened after the traumatic event occurred. These can look like an inability to remember important aspects of the traumatic event, even though a person was conscious and sober. Experiencing negative beliefs about a people or the world around them, such as the world is always dangerous or no one can be trusted. Having inaccurate beliefs about the cause or consequences of the traumatic event, such as a person taking the blame for their own sexual assault or feeling guilty for surviving an accident when a friend did not. Having consistent negative emotional states like feeling fear, anger, or guilt throughout the whole day. Experiencing a significant decrease in participation or interest in normal activities. Feeling detached or estranged from others. And lastly, a persistent inability to experience any positive emotions such as happiness or feelings of love towards others. One of these is the development of arousal symptoms, which look like changes in a person's reactivity following the occurrence of the traumatic event. A common arousal symptom is the development of irritability and angry outbursts that seem to come out of nowhere, which is typically shown through verbal or physical aggression towards objects or others. 
reckless or destructive behavior that was not present prior to the traumatic event may also occur. The development of hypervigilance, which is an enhanced state of sensitivity to the world around a person, which is meant to keep a person safe, but it comes with a significant increase in anxiety, which usually then leads to emotional exhaustion, a heightened or increased startle response, problems with concentration, and difficulty sleeping. All of the arousal symptoms associated with the development of PTSD are external symptoms, and they usually take the greatest toll on a person's relationships and activities of daily living.